Okay, so we are continuing tonight with our discussion on Manamuna, and we started about the question that what should be the motivation for Amuna? Or in other words, that Amuna Pshuta versus Amunat Chakira, that should we be aspiring for simple Amuna, or should we be aspiring for convoluted logical Amuna, which is based on Chakira, which is based on analysis. Okay? So, so um, last week, we presented some sources that there is value to Amunat Chakira, there is value to understanding things logically, and the value is that you're performing a mitzvah. That according to many opinions, that when you understand logically to prove the proof that there is a God, so you're actually performing a mitzvah, this is the mitzvah of Anachri Shemakacha. This is the, the mitzvah of Amunah, that a person can fulfill the mitzvah by understanding the logical basis for why a person should believe in God. Now, now let me backtrack. This is the, the, the truth is that there's a question that one of the mitzvahs, according to the Rambam, according to the Rambam, and it's really the, the basic understanding of the Gemara, that Amun is one of the 613 mitzvahs. Okay? How do I start, how this is in the Gemara? Because the Gemara says in the Yad Makkus that Torah Tzivala Moshe, Torah is the gematria, is the numerical value of 611. So the Gemara says that 611 mitzvahs Tzivala Moshe, we heard from Moshe Rabbeinu. And the other two, Anoichi Veloia, we didn't hear from Moshe, we heard from Hashem himself. At the, at the moment of Sinai and Shavuos, so we heard Hashem himself, every single Jew heard God's voice, saying, exclaiming, Anoichi Hashem Lekacha, I am, I am the Lord your God. And so, and that's, and so the Gemara says that that's one of the 613 mitzvahs. So we see this is, a, this is a clear proof to the opinion of the Rambam that this is one of the 613 mitzvahs as opposed to the Bahag. And the, the Bahag is of the opinion that it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to count it as a mitzvah because how can you tell somebody to believe? It doesn't make sense to command somebody to believe. Either you believe or you don't. If you believe, then you'll do it. Like, nobody's going to say, like, if you've got a saying this, that, that doesn't believe in something, so you say, I command you. I command you. Like, do you, do you believe? Do you, like, I don't know. Like what, something, I command you to believe in the tooth fairy. I, bel- I believe you to believe in coronavirus. I have that check. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it the same problem the, as commanding to love God? So to love that, that I mean, it's to to love um, the the return of also ask. How can you command somebody to to love? And but loving particularly the truth is the truth is that it's a misconception about love. That we think that that we're supposed to just fall in love. And we're just supposed to, love is just something which is supposed to happen to you. But the truth is that love is a decision. Okay? We can choose to love people and choose not to love people. So that's why on, on love, I think it's less of a question. But on belief, I think it's a very, it's a very strong question. You can, if, if you don't believe in something, so all the commandments in the world aren't going to, aren't going to change your mind. Right? So moreover, if you don't believe, so then why should, who should you, who's commanding you? <laughs> if you don't. <laughs> like that, the God that you don't believe in is commanding you to believe in Him. Mm-hmm. So that sounds pathetic. Right? Yeah. So that's why it doesn't make sense that the commandment of a Muna can't be to believe. So, so what could be? How could a person fulfill the mitzvah of a Muna? How could a person fulfill the mitzvah of an Eichel Shem if believing isn't a commandment? Because it doesn't make sense to command a person to believe. So, what exactly is? <laughs> Is the fulfillment of the mitzvah of an echel shel right? So, so the 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 Rambam understands the, that the answer to this question is that you know you're right. It's it's a good start to believe, and that doesn't fulfill the mitzvah. After you believe, you're obligated from the mitzvah. You're obligated to understand the logical premise that there actually is a God. Okay, and we said. This is also the opinion of the Sefer Achinuch. We said this is also the opinion of the Shalat, and the and we brought we brought other sources that this is the that this is in fact a positive thing and in fact a uh, mitzvah deraisa and a and a fulfillment of of other psukim as well. So on the other hand, on the other hand, so I think I shared with you that there's a book called Chavos Halvavos, um, the duties of the heart. Um, which was written by the Rishayim, by one of the Rishayim, Rabbeinu B'chayi Ibn Pekuda. And <coughs> so at the beginning of that sefer, he has a sefer called Shari Yichud. And that sefer, Shari Yichud, <coughs> is about proving that there is a God. And he explains that the reason why he's writing this chapter is because he, because he thinks it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to understand why you believe in God, etc. And so, and so 
in the in a very there's a famous print there's a famous commentary of the Sefer Chavos with a with a commentary called Lev Tov by a person named I think it's Pinchas Lieberman, and so like it, it, it's it's probably the most popular most popular print of Chavos Avos in Hebrew, and so when he gets to Shari Yichud, so then he has a thirty page essay about the the controversy about should a person learn Shari Yichud. And, and so he has the, there's like, so he starts with, he starts with these sources pro, and then he brings a lot, a lot of sources con. And that's why he says, and that's why I'm printing this part of Chavos Avavos, I'm printing this without a commentary, because in my personal opinion, you should skip it over and not bother. Okay, so, so what is, so, so a lot of the sources that I'm going to be sharing today are from him. So, so what is the, what is the, what is the cons? Okay, we spoke, last time we spoke, um, we, we spoke in general, but I want to go through this from the sources the reasons not to be involved in, in, philosophical, in philosophical analysis of whether or not there's a God. So, so I want to start with a tshuva from the Rivash. Rivash was one of the Yishayim. And, and so, so he, he writes that, that, he writes as follows, in Simon Menem the, the, the chapter 45 in the Rivash, it's a, it's a good idea to stay away from, from logical analysis and philosophical things. Even though some, some claim that you don't fulfill the mitzvah without this, but we accepted the truth. And my opinion is that, that the Torah is complete. You don't need to prove it from outside sources. That our Kabbalah, he says, that we received the truth. So the truth that we received is a greater truth than anything that they can do. We received it from the creator of the world in, through the vehicle of the greatest prophet that ever lived. And that's greater than anything. That's greater than anything that you could possibly think. Anything that you're going to figure out with your brain is absolutely nothing in comparison to the truth that we get from the Torah. Okay, so so this is a first a first critique on this approach that the way to fulfill the mitzvah of Muna is through is through um, philosophical analysis, and that is that any truth that you're going to reach, any <laughs> good popcorn. <laughs> so yeah, so so not it doesn't nothing compared to your crackers, but but um, but, uh, but thank you. So so <laughs> so the. The, so his first claim is that, that whatever you're going to come to, that y- the truth, the level of truth that you're going to achieve through, uh, through analysis doesn't come close to the truth that you're going to get through the Kabbalah, through the tradition, through what we received. Okay? So, the, so the, the summary of this critique is that you're, you're wasting your time because this, the conclusions that you're going to derive from philosophical analysis is not as um, profound as the conclusions that you're going to get by simply reading the Torah. Okay. So now, um, <clears throat> what does this mean? What does this mean? So the, I think that I think what he means is the and a couple of the, a couple of things he might mean by this. And he's like he's saying that you're wasting your time because the level of truth, the profundity of the of your conclusions is going to be less impressive than what you're going, whatever you're going to think of through that is less impressive than whatever you're going to get through the Torah itself. So I think what he means is, is on two levels. Number one, in, in quality and quantity, okay? Meaning that, first of all, in quality, that how much can you really understand through logic? Okay, by the way, when we're talking about logical proofs to the existence of God, so, so truth be told, I read the Shari Yichud, like over Shabbos, and like basically, it, it's it's very it's very very simple logical proofs. Basically, it's a it's a it's a complicated way of saying where the, where did the world come from? Mm-hmm. And basically, like he's he's it's, it's saying like he's he has some interesting like interesting things that like we understand that anything that has an end has a beginning, anything that has a beginning has an end. And like, but basically, it's it's basically that everything has to come from somewhere. So. It, it can't come from nowhere. It can't always be like whatever. So that, that's basically the that what he calls the logical proof is basically things like that. Okay. So <clears throat> when we're talking about the quality of how much 
you're going to understand. So that all that you can get through logic is only that something it comes from somewhere, that the world comes from somewhere. But you certainly don't know anything about that somewhere. You certainly don't know anything about the God that created the world. Right? So in terms of the quality of the Amuna, so that, that through logical analysis, you can only come to the conclusion that there is some kind of higher, higher power, but you actually don't know anything about him. Whereas if, you underst- if you're, the source of your knowledge is from the Torah, so then you know a lot about him. You know that Hashem is compassionate. You know that Hashem is good. You know that Hashem is perfect. You know? We, know, we know in terms of the quality of, the quality of, uh, of, um, of uh, you know, let's call it quantity. You could really switch, like, switch the, the terminology, but it doesn't matter. The, in terms of how much you know, in terms of how much we know about God, so you know much more if you're coming from the Torah, whereas if you're coming from logical analysis. But, and number two, it could be what he means is that, that, that philosophical analysis is nothing compared to the truth of the Torah in terms of the, the, the we call that quality or quantity? What? That was quality? Quantity. So quantity meaning how much amuna do you have? How much amuna do you have? If your amuna is really based on the fact that you came to the logical conclusion, so then, then how much amuna can we really say you have? Or in other words, we said this last week, that, that okay, I'm, I'm very smart, but somebody's smarter than me. So it's very possible, and I know that other people are smarter than me. So anything that I think, if I'm normal, so I'll think with a grain of salt. Right? And I know very well that this is what I think, but it could be that somebody is smarter than me, and he's going to outsmart me, and he's going to explain to me that I'm all wrong. Yeah. Usually that's the building blocks to the Hebrew stuff. Uh, like the Yitzhak Torah seminars, when they like reel you in, mm-hmm. they first <laughs> say, is there a God? And then they'll go into... Kiruv. I think you skipped a, a, lot of, a lot of important parts in the, in the Kiruv process. Well, um, the I, I think you, you forgot, you forgot the schmoozing. You forgot the buying a beer. Free stuff. Free stuff. <laughs> lots, of, lots of children. Yes, stipends. Yeah. Stipends. Yeah. yeah. So, like, the, it doesn't start. If you, if, you stop, uh, if you stop a kid, if you stop, stop a kid in Columbia University and say, say, can I prove to you that there's a God? So they'll say, no, but if there's a God, I'll have to stop uh, being pro-Palestine. <laughs> so. It's an important part. It's an important part of the process. It's an important part of the process for a person that, until now, was absolutely positive that there's no God. So it's important. It's important to show him that he's not being, uh, he's not being a, a baby. He's not being um, uh, just gullible. He's not being just uh, having an imaginary friend when he's believing in God. It's important to to make sure that he understands. Everybody understands that having that believing God is a logical thing. But I don't think that's the basis of the Kiri vote. Perhaps in the '60s. That was one of, more, one of the more fundamental ways that they did Kiruv, because then people were much more idealistic, and there, there was, it was much more of a thing that like if I like that people cared about the truth. Now people care about the truth much less, and they, they care more about stipends and and sushi, and and um, right what likes likes and you know n- nowadays you cannot do Kiruv without sushi. Um, I, I am impressed with that. <laughs> what's your guard though? There's the special vitamins in the sushi that they're sneaking it. Mm. Mm. And they mm. have this seminar about is there a God? Mm. That seems like the building blocks towards having stronger immune in the future. First right. We mentioned last week we mentioned last week that the question the question of what is the ultimate amuna is not a question for a person that doesn't have amuna. The question is that once you have amuna, is there value to having a logical basis for your amuna as well? person that says, do you believe in God? No, I don't. I'm atheist, actually. So then what, how can you help them? How can you help them? You can just say, well, don't you, aren't you scared of burning in hell? Do you know how hot hell is? No, it's, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to work. You know, it's not going to, like, it's hotter than the chillip, you know, <laughs> that, that it's the, it, so of, of course, like the, the only way to change a person's mind is to show them that it makes, that it makes logical sense. Right? But our, our question is not how do you convince an atheist that, that to believe in God. Our question is that that as religious Jews, is it part of the religi- religious experience to enhance our belief with logical basis? That's our question. That's our question. Right? There's no doubt that the person who who is protested atheist, so he uh, that that you can't tell him that just have simple belief, just close your eyes and believe. It's so simple. Works for me. I believe. 
No, it's after me. I believe. I believe. It, it doesn't relate that, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, so that's not our discussion. How do you convince an atheist? Mm -hmm. Okay. Our, our discussion is that is this the ideal? Is this what Hashem expects and wants from us to have to have a logical basis for our money? Yeah. Okay. So the first, so the first reason why the why, why the I'm sorry the revush was against uh, logical analysis was that that you're that you're you're cutting yourself short, you're selling yourself short. Your amuna is going to be less if your amuna is is confined to a logical amuna, because a that you don't know so much, and b the value, the how much you believe is actually is actually um, less, is actually not so strong, as opposed to if you believe because you trust the people that told you. So then that trust is going to be much stronger than things that you came with your conclusions, okay? And I think, I think this is really true. Like if you, if I, that if I, like, if you believe me, if you trust me, and, and I tell you, don't go in to, into the, into the women's section of the show. There's like, there, there's, there's like legit, there's, there's like a python there. Is it, uh, is, is gonna, is gonna uh, bite you and kill you. It's really, like there was a lot of other girls that didn't believe me, and they're dead now, and I, and so so if if you trust me, so so then then that's gonna be like, then you're gonna, it's, it's not gonna be a question. You're gonna have a thousand percent, believe me. You're gonna have to, it'll be a thousand percent in your heart that not to go to the assassination. Whereas if you start like you hear a little voice, you hear you hear a little noise, and you have some clues, and you have a, a theory, and you come to a logical conclusion that you know, I figured it out that. You know, well, the reason why that these people they go into the women's section and they just never come back, it must be because there's, <laughs> it must be because there's some place in the snake. Right? So it's going to be a theory of yours. It's going to be, it's, you'll, you can have logical basis to your conclusion, but which, which are you more sure of? The things that you came to a logical conclusion based on the evidence or the things that you trusted somebody to tell you? You actually have more, more, so, more resolution. You have more conviction of the things that you were told from someone you trust than the things that you came from logical, logical conclusions. I feel like that depends on which, which is easier for you to trust, your own logic or other people's convictions. I'm saying, I think everybody, I think everybody, I think, ev I'm not saying that I believe, I'm saying, I'm not telling you why, why I know this, but I'm telling you that I know this for a fact. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm telling, I'm telling you that I know this for a fact. You, and you don't question how I know this for a fact, right? You, you just trust me. You just trust me. But then we are trusting someone who is infinite to trust something infinite. No, you're not trusting someone infinite. You're trusting, you're, you're trusting me. Right. You're trusting. Maybe you're wrong. Right, but, but, you, but you trust me. But then I can, in the same way that I trust you, I could trust my logic. They're equally finite. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what you're saying. You're saying she should surrender her. No, 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 no. I'm not telling anybody to surrender to anybody. But if there's somebody that you trust, yeah. for whatever reason you trust them, mm -hmm. and they tell you that you can trust me, this really a bet. Mm. Like, I, I would not tell you if I wasn't a thousand percent sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that there's a guy. That's called, that, that's, what he's, that, that, that's what he's referring to. That's called the Anachnu Mikavlei Ha'amet. We received the tradition. What do you mean? Retrieve the tradition. We achieved, we received the tradition from people that we trust, and this is what we mentioned this last week. From that, this is the, what the Ramban claims. And this is what the Kuzari claims is the basis of the basis of Amuna is from Kabbalah. Is from receiving. It's not blind faith type of Christian. It's not blind faith at all. It's, it's 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 accepting somebody because you trust somebody. Is it because we trust that they received the tradition? Mm -hmm. They didn't come up with it themselves. Correct. That's an important point. Co no, correct. Abso absolutely. Absolutely. Right. If you're trusting, if you're, it's not your if, idea. If, it's, if it would be my idea, then your question would be valid. Yeah. Then, then your question is okay. So who has who has better brains, me or you? Mm -hmm. But if it's not coming from my brains, it's coming from that I got it from someone who knew, mm -hmm. who got it from somebody who knew, who got it from someone who knew. And ultimately, how did the first person know? Because they experienced it, because they were there at my Manhattan Sinai. So that's, a, so that's a stronger belief also from how much you know and also is how strong is your conviction. 
Okay, so that's the first claim. The first claim of the first claim of the of the Rivash is that you're wasting your time with analytical discussions, with philosophical discussions of trying to prove God from from philosophy, because you, you, the value of your amun is going to be less. Okay. So now, um, on that on that note, on that note, so I mention a story that it's a little, it's not it's not it's not, regard, it's not exactly the same topic, but it's it's I think it's a similar it's a similar idea, um, it's a relevant idea, and that is that that the first rabbi of Chabad, the Balatanya, so he was once speaking to his grandson, the Tanakh Tarek, that I just heard recently. I, did, I I think I heard this once before, but but. Um, but, this, but the Balatanya brought up his grandson, the Tzalach Tzedek, and the reason is because, oh, I, I read it in this context, because the, because the, the Balatanya would learn more Nebuchim, and would learn all the philosophical things with Tzalach Tzedek, and they had some, some deep reason why he specifically wanted to learn with him. But the story why he brought up his grandson is that the Balatanya was, 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 was dangerously, terminally ill, and his daughter apparently was very upset about this, and she, and when he was very very sick, she brought together urgently three great rabbis, and she begged of them to proclaim, as a bezdin, that if her father was, was decreed upon him to die, that she accepts upon herself that she's going to die in his stead. And, and um, and she somehow convinced them to agree, and, and the. And then two days later, she passed away. And the, and the, the rabbis that were in this Besden, they told the Balatanya the reason why she passed away. And so when he heard this, so he felt that if, that's the, if, if she gave up her life for me, so then I need to, I need to be her. I need to, to, to do everything. I, I need to give everything for her kid. I need to bring up her kid as if, as if he's my kid. Not that he wouldn't have otherwise, but, uh, but that's just a crazy story. Um, so anyway, so the Tamil Sadak once asked the Balatanya that, sorry, the, 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 it wasn't a question. He's just, the, he's just, he just told them that, that there's, that the word tzaddikim, that the word tzaddikim, that, that they got magidim. A magid, a magid is, is sometimes a person can reach a higher spiritual level that a soul from the other world will come down to teach him secrets of the Torah. Okay? The Vilna Gaon had Magidim. The the Rabbi Yosef Karo is, fa- is famous. Is a famous, a very famous Magid. Um, he the, the reason why it's so famous. The the, the, the Magid of the of the, of the Rabbi Yosef Karo is because he wrote a book of the conversations that he had with his Magid, and he called it Magid Meshavim. This is all the conversations he had with this the soul of the the soul of, of some of some tzaddik that came down to teach him secrets of the Torah. So so the. So the Baltanya told the Tzaddik that the word Tzaddikim, the Megidim came to teach them secrets of Torah, and the Tzaddikim said, "No, I don't want you to tell me. I don't want you to. I, I don't. I don't want to, you to give away any secrets. I want to figure it out with my own toil, with my own efforts, with my own um, thinking process. I, I. I don't want presents. I don't want a free ride. I want to work for my. I want to. I want to work for my understanding. I want to work for my Torah. I don't give away secrets for free." So no pain, no gain. Now there's not, there's, it says in the Zohar that if you, that there's, there's, it's something, it, it's it's important to to pay for mitzvahs. It's important to pay for mitzvahs. If you get, if you, like, if somebody wants to give you a free, a free, uh, a free lulav and joke, so you, you should um, you should pay him something. You shouldn't like to to, to do a mitzvah for free is like it, it's not worth it. So so the. So he said, so there's Tadikim that didn't want, didn't want the free, free secrets of the Torah. And the Balatanya told him that, that it's really silly because anyway you're going to toil, anyway you're going to work to understand the Torah on a, on a, as, as best you can. But what the, so what's the difference if, if, you, if you start here and you have to toil to get to here, or if the, if the, the Magid teaches you the secrets that you get automatically to here, and then you toil to get from here to here. You, you end up in a higher place. So you're going to end up with a deeper understanding of Torah if you allow the Magid to teach you the secrets, and you'll get even higher. So you're, you're still working. You're working the same amount. It's just you're working to reach higher levels that you wouldn't reach otherwise. But, well, two things. First of all, um, is learning the secrets of Torah a Tayyad mitzvah? 
Like, why do they? Why is that any different than just learning Torah? As far as paying for a mitzvah. Okay, we're, we're, talking, we're talking about paying in terms of the effort, right? That's what I mean. The oh. the, 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 the the working on it to get to get to a deeper okay. to get to a deeper um, deeper understanding. The 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 mitzvah of learning Torah is to understand the Torah as deeply as possible. So it's certainly uh, the, the every the, that's why the mitzvah of learning Torah is an endless mitzvah because because there's no end to the depth of Torah. So so they the so they wanted to understand Torah and the and the Baal was saying that that there's no difference if you there's no you don't you don't get less reward because because you got a free present because you're still working and you're going to be working to get to an even higher level. Right? So so in the same vein so that that if you're like a person can think that I want I I, I want it to be like I want my I want my Torah to be something that I understand but if at the end of the day that requirement to make my emuna something that I understand is going to end up that you're going to be left with a pathetic low Torah low emuna I mean so then you're actually cutting yourself short how do you know something like that say how do you know that's going to be the outcome how could you possibly know that uh, the well, that's what he's saying that by definition that by definition the emuna that you're going to get from your own evaluation is by definition going to be less than the emuna that you would re- that you would that you have from receiving from the tradition for two reasons like to explain also in quantity, also in quality. That, that you know less and your conviction is, is less strong. So by all, by all means, you're cutting yourself short by, by um, um, necessitating this logical proof. Okay, so that's the first, that's the first claim. <coughs> that's um, that the reason why a person shouldn't get involved with analytical analysis of the of Imuna is because you're actually wasting your time because you're not getting anywhere. You're, you're going to get to a lower Amuna than you would have if you would just left yourself with your traditions, with trusting the people that taught you. Okay? Okay. Number two. He quotes the, the Rivash himself quotes this. Um, and this is and this is from one of the Gainim, Rav Haigon. Rav Haigon, that the um, that he writes as follows. Rav Haigon. That Rav Agon is, is telling is, is, t- is telling somebody about about how he should learn Torah, what what kind of how he should spend his time in yeshiva. So he tells them that Mishnah v'Talmud midat tovah lidabik b'darchei Torah gamli amli that 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 everyone should learn Mishnah and Gemara. Okay, okay, and girls could also learn Gemara. You know, the Rav Trevi said that it's okay. <laughs> so so and he, so he says umi shi yaseret hazeh v'yatasek v'dvarim acherim. And a person that's, that, that's not going to learn Gemara, he's saying, I, I, don't, I don't like Gemara. Um, it's too complicated for me. I like philosophy. I like Jewish philosophy. Okay? So, so if a person uh, a person is going to say, I don't like learning Gemara, I, I prefer learning philosophy. So, it's, so what's going to happen? So eventually he's going to detach himself from Torah and from and from fear of heaven, and he's going to mess with his brain until he doesn't even realize that he no longer davens. It's very fascinating that he that he that he he pinpoints davening as the thing that's going to go first in his religious downfall. Um, and this is something that we mentioned we mentioned uh, on a different occasion that about uh, that people that philosophize too much so. They, they lose their emotional connection with God. And a person who doesn't have an emotional connection with God, so the hardest mitzvah to do is to daven. The hardest mitzvah. You, you, can, you can fake it through. You can certainly learn Torah. Learn, uh, learning, learning Torah is something that you can absolutely learn Gemara and learn Halacha without believing in God. You can absolutely take a lulav. You can absolutely put on tefillin. You can absolutely have a seder. You can, you, you can, you can do every mitzvah. You can do every mitzvah except davening is poison. A person that doesn't have an emotional connection with God, to daven is absolute poison. And I mentioned that there's a famous Jewish influencer that said on some podcast that, that, that he has trouble with davening, that he's struggling with his davening because of his philosophical views uh, based on his understanding of the Rambam, that it, 
that the way he understands philosophy, so it doesn't really make sense that God should answer his prayers, that God should be listening to his prayers, and because he doesn't really believe that God is really listening to his prayers, so it's really hard emotionally for him to daven. So that's why all his friends know that when you want davening to end in two and a half minutes flat, so ask him to be the chazan, and he knows how to get it done because he really just is just waiting for it to end. Wait, he says God doesn't answer his prayers based on the Rambam? His, he got mixed up with philosophy. I'm just like the Rav Haigon. <laughs> I, I agree. The, the tefillah is one of the is one of the mitzvahs in the in the Torah, and the, Ram, the Rambam is of the opinion that tefillah is a, is actually a Torah obligation every single day. So you're besides the fact that the Torah itself is full of is full of the fact that and they cried out to God and God answered their prayers. So that, uh, obviously, it's it's very clear in the Torah that prayer is a real thing in Judaism. But because he got involved with philosophical discussions, so he mixed himself up. So it's very interesting that Rav Haigon understood that the first thing that's going to go is davening, okay? So, so, And if they tell you, no, 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 you don't understand, learning philosophy is the only way that you're actually going to connect with God. That you, that with your, with your infantile depiction of God, you're not really connected with God. If you really want to understand God, you have to mature. You have to really have a, a, a more sophisticated understanding of God, of reality. And that's why it's actually going to elevate your entire human experience, certainly your religious experience. That, that's how they're going to try to, to, to um, reel, you in. reel you in. Thank you. So he says, so he says, Lo the 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 and they're, they're lying to you. Don't don't listen to him. Velo timsa. Now he writes he writes a very a very very uh, strong statement here. Velo timsa yirashimayim, and you will not find fear of heaven, v'yirashet, and the and fear of sinning uzrizut, and excitement about Judaism, va'anava and humility, v'tara and purity, uktusha and holiness. Ella b'mizaskem b'mishnah v'tamid. You the only you only find these positive character traits by people who learn Gemara halacha, by learning Tanakh, by learning the real things, by learning Torah, and not by the people that they learn philosophy. Okay? What does philosophy mean? Like, what Sfarim would you categorize as philosophy? Because that seems like... We're talking about the Marna Vuchem, we're talking about this one chapter in Chavah Salavas. Like, and Chavah mm-hmm. Tavavot. And, and moreover, they'll tell you that when they're learning Aristotle, they're also learning Torah. They'll tell you that when the, the everything, the where they're, just, where they're just sitting and thinking and contemplating and meditating on is there a God? What is God? Does it really make sense? Does it, that they'll, they'll claim that all of that is, in, is an act of learning Torah. And that's what the Rav God is saying, that no, 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 you're just mixing yourself up. You're actually distancing yourself from your goals as a Jew. You're actually distancing yourself from, from Emuna. Mm-hmm. And, it's, um, and it's, it's, a big, it's a big farce. Okay? Well, no, no, no. The philosophy, and well, philosophy is, uh, is is specifically speaking about logical understanding. Mm-hmm. Okay. Trying to understand with my logical base, with my analytical abilities. Okay. That's not the same thing. Not at all. Not at all. So, okay. Now, a similar thing. A similar. A, this is now we get to Rabbi Nachman. This is officially the reason why we're speaking about this is because of Rabbi Nachman's very strong. Very strong opinions on this on this matter. So, the so Rabbi Nachman Rabbi Nachman writes. He was like in many places that he was that that he that he he very much despises the learning of philosophy. Um, he writes that Umi Shalomed Chas V'Shalom B'Sifri Hamachakim B'Halisofim Nichnas Belivos Fekot Ukfirot. A person a person that learns God forbid in the books of these of these philosophers. Or these academics, so that that into his heart enters doubts and and heresy. Wasn't Rambam a philosopher? Perhaps we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, so so the so Rabbi Nachman writes that that and this is along the same lines, but he says it more clearly and more more openly. That along the same lines as Rafagrain, that it's not going to bring him close to God. He says the person that learns philosophy so is going to start having doubts. Is going to start start not really believing. Is going and is eventually is going to come to 
to misunderstand things. Okay. Okay. Now, the there's a there's there's a third there's a third issue. There's a third issue that I want to jump to at this point. That the first two issues are number one that you're wasting your time because you're not going to get anywhere with this analytical understanding. Number two, you're endangering your relationship with God because it's because it's going to, you're going to have svikot, you're going to, it's going to start mixing you up. If you get to a deep, deep enough level of philosophy, you're actually, going to, you're actually going to get mixed up. By the way, I should add, the Rebbe Nachman explains that by definition, if you're going to get involved with philosophy, you're going to get mixed up, because he explains in one of his Torahs that in, that in Jewish thought, there's actually things that we cannot understand, or what he calls she'elot she'en alehem shuvot, that, there's, that there are questions that don't have answers. So, and that we understand that these are by nature questions that don't have answers, and we can live with the fact that there's a question that doesn't have an answer. But if you're coming from the perspective of a philosopher, so then when you have a question that doesn't have an answer, you're mixed up. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, so that's why, that's why Ibn Nachman says that by, de- by definition, the more that you get involved with philosophical thinking, you're going to get mixed up because there actually are contradictions, paradoxes out there. And you're just going to, and at that point, you're going to get mixed up. So you would have been better off without it. Okay, okay. So now the, there's a third issue that I want to bring. This is, and this is an issue which is brought up by the Sefer. It's called Sefer Habrit by a Jew by the name of Pinchas Mivolna from approximately 300 years ago. And he claims that actually, this is like I think I think it's an extreme view, but I want to bring his idea onto the table. That actually, every time that you learn philosophy, you're actually doing a sin. You're actually doing an avera. It's against one of the 630 commandments. Which of the 630 commandments is that? It's one, something that we say every day in Shema. It says, we say in Shema, And don't turn, don't sway after your heart and after your eyes that the... That, I, that, I, that, that you have these natural tendencies to sway. So Chazal say, what does it mean to sway after your heart? Zu minus, that's referring to heresy. Not, not to sway after your eyes, zeznus. That's reference, reference to, to sexual immorality. Okay? That a person has a tendency to sway, to sway towards these things, and a person has to velota, to do not sway, be very strong, be, keep straight. Keep, just keep on walking. Keep walking. <laughs> keep walking. Don't don't turn. Don't sway towards these things. Your heart referring to heresy, and your eyes referring to sexual immorality. So the Rambam writes, this is in Hilchos of the Zara, that the Rambam writes in Parak Bet of the Zara that that is, first of all the, it's, it, the context is that he's saying that there's things that you're not supposed to that you're not supposed to learn about the Zara. You're not supposed to, not only are you supposed to not worship a Zara, you shouldn't even learn about a Zara. Mm-hmm. And then he continues that Any thought that the thought will bring you away from God, we are commanded not to have these thoughts. Okay, okay. So he explains why. Because human understanding is very, is very small. It's very limited. Not everybody is actually able to come to the truth on their own. If everybody is going to just follow the thoughts of their thoughts of their heart. He's going to to destroy the world, meaning his his uh, world of emunah, his world of of his core beliefs. He's going to, to, to just destroy his world because he's done. Sometimes he'll, he'll he'll decide that paganism is correct. Sometimes he'll think that monotheism is correct. Um, I'll start thinking what's above, what's before. Sometimes he'll believe in prophecy. Sometimes he won't believe in prophecy. Sometimes he'll decide that the Torah is really divine. Sometimes he'll decide the Torah is really not divine. 
אין יודע המידוס שיודעים בהם עד שיהיה דהם עשה בריא ונמצא יודע על ידי מינוס. And so he doesn't really understand, he's not so smart, he doesn't know how to think, and so he's going to make mistakes and he's going to end up a heretic. And he says, and that's what the Torah says, V'ainin zei zira ter v'neimer bav l'sesur achlevav chem v'achrei enichem asher etem zainim. That this is what, this is what the Torah prohibits, that a person should not allow himself to follow his curiosity to think about these things in an analytical manner. So the philosophy that's being discussed in Achrei Bava's son is strictly heretical philosophy. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Right. There's, there's no problem with, with, with learning that. physics. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Right. We're talking about things that, that theology. There's a problem is learning in learning theology, so. And it it seems like this author is assuming that it's somebody. It's the Rambam. The Rambam is the, is this author. If the Rambam, he's assuming that if somebody studies heresy, their emotion, their connection to it is emotional and not logical, and that's mm-hmm. why they're wishy-washy about their views. But what if they study it as an intellectual, and it's not so wishy-washy. Okay, so, 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 so let me let me explain. That, I mean, uh, not, uh, the being wishy-washy is not because they're wishy-washy. Being wishy-washy is simply because is because people evolve. People people we get smarter and smarter. And w- one day you you were at your pinnacle, and the next day you got even smarter. So you th- realized that you were wrong. And the next day you realized that you were wrong again. Like, it's not about being wishy-washy. It's just growing. Okay? But the question is that the Rambam is actually contradicting himself, meaning that it's very sweet to quote the Rambam as the source why you're not allowed to learn Jewish philosophy. But hold on a second, but isn't the Rambam the, 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 the most famous Jewish philosopher that ever lived? But he's not saying it for himself, he's saying it for you. Oh, come on. Do as I say, not as I do. So, no. so, so, how, so how could the Rambam... So the question, is, the question is that the Rambam obviously didn't think that he was doing a sin every time that he was that he was involved in philosophy. Moreover, remember the Rambam is is the one who says that the proper way to fulfill the mitzvah of Amuna is by giving it an analytical logical basis. So it seems to be a contradiction. Right? So how could the Rambam say that first of all this is the only way to perform the mitzvah and on the other hand that every time you're thinking philosophically you're doing a sin. That's a that's a clear contradiction. So clearly we're talking about different things. And that is your motivation. That is, that why are you opening this philosophy book right now? Why are you starting to become a philosopher? There's two reasons why a person could theoretically start thinking philosophically. Number one is, number one is that, that it says in the Torah that it's not enough to just have blind faith. Hashem wants me to understand why I believe. Okay? So if that's your motivation, if your motivation is that, that I want my brain to be on board with my convictions, that the Rambam claims is a mitzvah. And that the other Rishonim say that you're wasting your time, don't bother. Okay? But if a person, there's another motivation, another place to come from with your philosophical questions, and that is, and that, is that hmm, everything's open. Everything's open. Let's, let's start from scratch. I'm going to tabula rasa and let's decide if there is a God or not. Okay? And so to come to that conclusion, to allow yourself to come to that conclusion, that's what the Torah is really saying. In other words, that we're talking about a person, like we said already numerous times, we're not talking about a person who's an atheist. That this whole discussion is only discussing people that already have a Muna and want to enhance the Muna by logical understanding. Is that a positive thing or a negative thing? That is our question that we're dealing with. And the Rambam, the Rambam seems to think it's a positive thing. And at the same time, there's a prohibition of velocity. And so what is that? So that is that, that a person, a person that a person has certain things that they know. Okay? A person has certain things that they, they live life with these basic statutes, with these basic like I'm that I, I I think I read a book once about a person that like started having this conspiracy theory that like their mother wasn't really their mother. And like and I and I, and I it's like a person ha- can have like doubts. A person can have doubts and like, and then it p- like prove like prove things like, how come you don't have pictures of me as a baby? And I, and I, and I, and, I, and, I, and they can develop this whole theory. And and so, as these doubts are coming, and like of course it starts just because she grounded me. Like, I, I, it's like, I, like you can't. Be. And so the the the, the so a person has a certain a certain 
uh, assumption that I live my life with a certain assumption. Okay, and and then then I said, uh, there's there's reason to doubt. Like the reason to doubt. Like the like the like people are going to ask you questions to try to convince you that there's a flat Earth. Right? So so the they're going to convince you that that um, w that um, there's a guy in Nachlot that, 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 is, that is convinced that, um, that we, we that uh, maybe it's connected to flat Earth. I'm not exactly sure that like that we didn't actually we didn't actually ever go to the moon. Okay. Then, right? A lot of people believe that. Right? Yeah. Right? Okay, uh, that, that's not the point. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the, or, uh, like I was speaking to somebody yesterday that um, that uh, I, I think I think I I hope it was just because he was having a manic episode. But like he was telling me that uh, he doesn't believe in the whole world of, of medicine and the whole of the whole America is just they're trying to kill you and they're trying oh, to. Big pharma? They, maybe he, he said that. I think so. Yeah, I think he said that word somewhere in his yeah. speech. Yeah. So, and uh, and the whole coronavirus doesn't exist and the whole uh, and like there's all uh, conspiracy theories. Like the person's gonna have we have these certain assumptions in life that we live our life with that like that no there's not. The the people the, the 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 whole American construct is not based on these Satan worshippers. That no 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 it, it that <laughs> the Satan worshippers are not the ones really calling all the shots in rigging the elections. <laughs> and like that's not the way it works. And so so a person is gonna well, we, so a person has these certain doubts. Like for whatever reason, it's gonna, if a person has a doubt for whatever reason, it doesn't matter why they have the doubt. So now at that point, the person has two options. Okay? And this is what any psychologist is going to tell you about anxiety. They, you have a person who has these fears. And so that you can have two, two ways to deal with your fears. Two ways to deal with these doubts. That either you can be strong and just shut up these doubts and you continue living a normal life, or you can let these doubts eat you up. Okay? And when a, person, when a person allows these doubts to eat them up, then they become a lunatic. Then they're, then they're, they're like, no, it's really, it's really sad when the person allows their fears to control them. So then they, they lose it. They lose we it. Should solve yeah. it. Right? The way to solve it is to is to say like, this is just no, you don't you don't have to solve it. Just let it go. You just let it go. Yeah, just oh. say. On the other yeah. hand, that's precisely the point. That I think you just can't dig that deep, and you just can't you can't prove it. If you try to dig mm -hmm. so deep and try to prove it, you're just going to dive yourself. Every person is going to say like like, can you prove to me? Like to pr prove to me that the whole world of medicine is real. Maybe it's all just big some scandal to kill us all. Like I'm not sure why exactly they want to kill us all, but they for sure want to kill. They, there's remember there was this conspiracy theory with the coronavirus uh, vaccine, that that the whole vaccine was 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 behind this. The, the 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 thought behind the vaccine was to make everybody sterile that they can't have children because because Bill Gates believes that there's a population crisis and just yeah. too many people. And so, uh, it's like, like uh, so when a person, so a person could say, prove it. So, and then, so then you're gonna say, okay, you know what? I'll prove it. I'm gonna spend the next 30 years of my life proving and uh, proving that it's, that it's really, that it's, and in this, in this 30 years, so first, besides the fact that the greatest tragedy is that I'm, waiting, I'm wasting 30 years of my life. But, but besides that, Rabbi Nachman is saying that it could be that once I get so involved in treating this crazy alternative reality as something valid, so I might, I might buy into it at some point, and I might join their, join their side. So you've never questioned anything the media says? I didn't say that. Well, I didn't say it. I, it sounds like those are the examples you're giving, no? Um, Someone no. who says maybe this vaccine isn't, uh, you know, what it says it's going to be. I don't call I that. That's yeah. healthy skepticism. That's skepticism. statement mm -hmm. that they made the vaccine Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that you have to get the vaccine. I also didn't get the vaccine. But, uh, but, 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 I, but, 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 but the thought that they made the vaccine to kill us, that's insane. That's, that, that, that's a sickness. That's a person who's psychotic. Okay. Okay. So, so this is, so the, so the mitzvah of Alessa Suru is that the person, that everybody, everybody has times that they question. Everybody, a person, anybody that has a muna, is going to have questions. That hold on, but God, where are you? And then, and then the the most natural answer to God, where are you? Is well, maybe, maybe he's not here because because it's just because there's just no God. That that it's the simplest conclusion. That's called a doubt. Okay, that's called a doubt. So now, the velocity serial means that when you have these doubts, you have two options. Either you should brush them off 
and say that I just need a good night's sleep and a my favorite music, or that, or or you could say, yeah, let's think about this. Let's become a philosopher and like, and and like because and because like I don't understand where God was when I lost my job. So then I'm going to become an atheist. And I and that's what the philosopher means. That don't be stupid. Like, that don't allow these anxieties, don't allow these doubts to take you over, to just put them aside. Okay? And this is a, this is very just very healthy, um, emotional psychological advice of lesser sir. So it does not mean that it uh, it does not mean that when you have when you when you have a, a sturdy foundation in Amuna that you're actually doing a sin by analyzing it philosophically, because when the Rambam was analyzing things philosophically, he had this from Emuna. He knew that I'm not going to allow my doubts to get me to go over overboard, and he simply wanted to perform the mitzvah of understanding Hashem logically. Yeah, yeah. What do you say, though, that it's according to this belief? I don't know, mm-hmm. accurate to say, ah, I'm having questions in my faith. I shall not ask very like one. No, I think it's very logical. That I think it's like the truth. You have questions, don't think about it. Believe. It depends why you thought the first time. It depends why you thought the first time and where and where where your questions are coming from. Well, whether you believe or not, it boils down to two outcomes. You're either right, you either believe or you don't believe. And either each of those outcomes has two outcomes. You're either right or you're wrong. <laughs> So, no. if you don't believe and you're right, so be it. But if you're wrong, the outcome is pretty bad. So I feel like that's one of the that's, 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 like, that, 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 that's, that's a different point. That that, that, that was uh, that, like, that's, called, that's called that's, that's called like, that's called Pascal's argument. Okay. Yeah. I've never heard that. He says he says that you're that, that like look, look at consider the risk factor. If yeah. you're if really there is a God, if, sorry, if, if really there's not a God, and you were religious your whole life, so what do you lose out? You lost out a couple, a couple of shrimps, a couple of uh, hookups. Uh, like, um, no, I'm saying, what, what do you lose out? But if, if, if really it's all, if really there's no God, yeah. But you're religious, uh-huh. so what do you lose out? Would you lose out? Yeah, you lost out. What do you lose out if there really is no God? But you yeah. Feel like so you lose out. You, you, Nothing. Yeah, you didn't get to eat all the foods. You didn't get to, to hang out with the boys that you wanted to hang out. You didn't like the. Yeah. The, the, a lot of uh, like sins you didn't you didn't get yeah. a lot of sins that you wanted to do that you didn't get to do okay but if really if you live your life that there's no god and really there is a god then what's you what do you lose then you go to hell so yeah. that's so that's so the 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 risk factor he says is <laughs> is greater on the side so the based on the risk factor you should believe that that's not what we're saying because nobody wants to live their life like that I mean, people, I'm just saying, when I've doubted, if, I've, if i've had doubts in my amuna that always <clears> puts you right back on track the reason <laughs> let, let, let's go back the, the opposite of Amuna from Chakira is Amuna from Kabbalah. Okay? The basis of our belief is that we receive the tradition from people we trust. Okay? The question is that once we have that tradition, the people we trust, that we really trust, they tell us, I know. Mm-hmm. Trust me because I know. Okay? And so the question is, so should we enhance that or, question, or should we question that? When we have a question, we have a reason to believe that I know that you told me you know, but there's something about this that doesn't make sense to me. So how should we react to that? Should we react that, okay, it's okay for it not to make sense because he knows? Or should we say, oh, no, no, everything has to stop. I need to understand this. So the Rambam says that, who do you think you are that you, that, that you can understand? No, we're not the religion of questions. That that it's we're, we we love we, we love expanding our knowledge, but that we, but when you, when your questions are, I'll tell you, there's two kinds of questions. There's two, there's two kinds of questions. Sorry, I think with, with this we'll conclude. That a person once um, a person once came a person once came to Reb Chaim Salavechik, and he said, Rabbi, I have a lot of questions in. Jewish philosophy that I want to ask you. The questions, uh, the questions, the difficult questions on, on Judaism and Torah and God. And, and uh, so, is it okay if I ask you? And so, Chaim, so, he's, so Chaim says, sure, no problem. But he noticed that the person wasn't religious. He wasn't wearing a kippah, he didn't, uh, didn't look anything, uh, didn't have any, any Jewish, uh, anything Jewish on him. And so, so he said, so, but, just, but just tell me something. 
did you grow up religious? He says, yes, I did. And these questions, when did you think of these questions? Did you think of these questions when you were still religious? Or did you think of these questions after you stopped being religious? So he said, come to think of it, most of the questions I thought of after I stopped being religious. So he says, in that case, I can't answer your questions. Because those aren't questions, those are answers. And I can't give an answer to an answer. Okay, what did he mean? That what he, what he was saying was that if, you, if, if, if after you stop being religious, you thought of a question, that's not really a question. Meaning, your question is a different question. Your question is, how can I break Shabbos if it says in the Torah you're supposed to keep Shabbos? That's a question. So your answer is that there's no God. So if there's no God, I don't have to keep Shabbos. Problem solved. That's called an answer. Okay? A question, a question would be that if, I, if I'm still believing and I have a question, that, hold on a second, how does it make sense that Hashem is really telling us to do this if such and such and such? That's a question. Okay? Um, in other words, that there's something very beautiful in the, in the, in the Hebrew language that the word, the word, the word shayla, we know what shayla means question, right? But there's another, uh, another context in the Gilas Esther. So, so it says that, that, uh, that Esther invited Ahasuerus to the party. And Ahasuerus asked Esther, Ma she'ela tech, Esther Hamalka? What is your she'ela? What is your she'ela, Queen Esther? So what was Ahasuerus asking? Like, what, what, what did, you, did you see any good, good philosophical debates today? <laughs> Should we? So what is saying is, are you, are you pro-Israel, pro-Palestine? Like, what was like, what's your question of the day? No, that's not what he meant. He meant, what is your request? Right? She'ela means request in that context. Why is it that we use in Hebrew, we use the same word for a question as we do for a request? Because a true question is a request for an answer. Mm. Okay? And the opposite of the opposite of a the opposite of a of a shayla is the is what, what could we call a kushya. And that is when, when your your question that isn't really a question, it's actually proving a point. That you, your question is that the the assumption of the person that you're asking is wrong. And therefore I proved you wrong by my question. That's not a question question is that I really believe that there is an answer. Okay? So as long as your questions are she'elot, so then that's, we are certainly, we are certainly a nation of she'elot. Okay? Because that we want to in, in, inform ourselves. We want to become wiser. We want to become closer to the truth. And that's she'elot. Because the more questions you ask from a, pressure, from a place of humility, from a place of that, I believe that there's an answer. I would love to know the answer. So that's beautiful. But if you're coming that let me prove you wrong, so then, then like, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fight with you if, the, if, you're, if you, if you, if in, you insist on believing that I'm wrong. So, you're welcome to do so. Okay. So, so this is the, um, so th- this this is the, um, the when the Torah says when the Torah says that there's a prohibition of, prohibition of having philosophical thoughts. That means when a person that means that when a person has these doubts and they say, "Okay, that's it. I'm starting from scratch." And now, I'm, at that, what, what do you mean when you when you're saying I'm going to start from scratch? What are you really saying? You're really saying I'm giving in to my doubts, and I'm allow, that I allowed them to overcome me. I allowed them to eat me up and say that now I have no idea what the truth is, and now I'm going to come with open eyes and see wherever my logic leads me. Okay. So at the moment that you make that decision to leave your amuna on the side, then you lost your amuna. And that's what the Torah is saying. Don't lose your amuna. Don't let these anxieties eat you up. Don't, let, don't, let, don't allow these doubts to eat you up. So, so, this, is, um, so this, this is not blind faith. This is, that, this is that to accept the tradition because of the tradition, because it's coming from people that we trust, not to allow our logic to interfere with things that we know from things which are greater than our personal logic. Because our personal logic, they, let alone that even the human logic in general is very limited, but certainly my personal and individual logic is very limited because I'm not so smart. These people are much, who are much smarter than me. Okay, so, so I do want to, I, 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 I think I want to really finish this up um, today. So I just want mention, to mention two, mention two, one last point, and that is that, and that is that that even though, even after clarifying, the Rambam didn't, did, wasn't doing a sin when he was learning, when he was learning philosophy. But, um, but it's still, but it's still, the question is that he, he wrote a whole book about it. 
And so if Rabbi Nachman was saying that you should stay far away from, philosoph from, from, from philosophy, if Rav Haigon said that if you learn philosophy, it's going to mess with you, so why did the Rambam actually think that it was so good for him himself to do it? So, 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 the, so Rav Pinchas Mivelna says two things that it's important to know. Number one, that the word Mar Nebuchim, the, his name, the name of the book was Mar Nebuchim, that is a guide for the perplexed. So the Rambam writes in the introduction to Mar Nebuchim that the reason why he wrote this is because people in his generation were actually very mixed up. And that's a fact. The fact that, that, that he was writing this for a person who was already mixed up. So he felt an obligation to help his fellow Jew to get go into the mud, even though it might be dangerous for him, because I love these people so much, I'm going to get into the philosophy in order to be able to, uh, to answer them properly. Okay, that's number one. Okay? And number two, number two, and so that's why, the reason why, he, the, the, when we think, the Rambam wasn't a philosopher, he was, he, 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 he was a philosopher because, that possibility number one is because he thought it was necessary for his times. But point number two is, something which is, I think, very true, that the reason why the Rambam was so involved in in philosophy is because the Rambam actually had a misunderstanding. Because he actually had a misunderstanding. And that is that the Rambam writes elsewhere that the, the, in the Talmud, it talks about that the highest level of understanding about as things called Ma'asei Bereshit and Ma'asei Merkava. Okay? Things having to do with creation and things having to do with the divine chariot. Okay? Which is not another way of saying understanding of divinity. Okay? Now, we know, based on the writings of the Zohar, that these are actually Kabbalistic references. The Maisa Bereshit and Maisa Mekava are Kabbalistic references. And so really, <clears throat> what Chazal was saying when he's saying that Maisa Bereshit and Maisa Mekava are the highest level, of, highest level of Torah, really what they meant was that the highest level of Torah is really Kabbalah, is really to learn the secrets of the Torah. However, the secrets of the Torah were not known during the time of the Rambam. There's a whole story that the Zohar was only revealed much later. So the secrets of the Torah, the Chachmah of Kabbalah, the wisdom of Kabbalah, only became a thing after the Rambam was dead already. The Rambam was saying he had no idea that there was this area of Torah called Kabbalah. So because of his ignorance to this part of the Torah called Kabbalah, he, he knew that there was something called Maestro Bereshit and Maestro Merkava. So in his ignorance, he assumed that the Chazah must have been talking about Jewish philosophy. So he was actually convinced that when he is learning philosophy, he's actually learning the highest level of Torah understanding. Wait, who, did, who said that he, who, was, who thought that he was talking about philosophy? The Rambam. The Rambam writes. I know, I don't know. Right, but who thought the Rambam? Who? Ah, the, the, there's Rav Enchus Mivilna. Rav Enchus Mivilna writes that, that, that the Rambam most, most certainly thought that this is what Chazal meant when he talked about the highest level of learning Torah. And that's why he thought that it was a positive thing to learn. But we know that the truth is that that Maestro Bereshit and Maestro Merkava are actually talking about Kabbalah. And in, in, there's a very interesting, very interesting letter to the Lav Cherevi that somebody asked him, like literally this question: what, what's, the, what's the best way? What's the best way to go to Amuna? Should it be from Kabbalah or from simple Amuna or or Chakira or analytical? He says you absolutely need both. You absolutely need, need both. And if you want to analyze Kabbalah, if you want, sorry, if you want to analyze, if you have a philosophical Kabbalah, uh, a ph philosophical Amunah, you know what you should do? You should learn Tanya. You should learn Hasidus. Because if you learn Hasidus, then you're going to know that in a very deep, uh, complex, uh, very, very amazing way, all the details of how to understand Hashem and all, everything that Amunah really entails. And he didn't say that you should question everything and say, how, how, how can I prove it? That, that's, that's really wasting your time and you're getting yourself further away. So he was really being a little bit, <laughs> a little bit uh, manipulative over there. That yes, you should absolutely do Chakira, but the Chakira that you should do is to become a Hasid. You know? mm -hmm. so, so this concludes our discussion of Amuna, Amuna Pshuta, simple Amuna versus analytical Amuna, that according to some, according to some um, sources, there is a positive mitzvah of giving a logical basis to our to our amuna, but many, according to many of them, it's not. Both because you're wasting your time and because it has dangers. And the and it seems that Rabbi Nachman is certainly of the opinion that it's that it's more dangerous. And but everyone agrees. Everyone agrees that if a person is going to just say, okay, let's be an open, let's be an, let's be open-minded, let's just learn philosophy, and wherever my studies lead me, that's where I will go. That is certainly against the Torah because 
everybody, everyone agrees that you certainly also have to have this foundation of that I believe the Torah because people I trust, because my Shabbat taught me that I should that, to, to believe in the Torah, and why shouldn't I trust him? So, so that's why I um, said to have a, a philosophical mindset that I'm only going to believe it if it makes sense to me, that everyone agrees is going against the Torah. And the question is only that can I enhance that Amunah with an intellectual understanding. Toda <laughs> Rabbah.